Hi everyone, Dr. Shook here. Welcome to the podcast. On today's episode, what I want to do is I want to respond to a question that I received recently and one that comes up quite often. And this is, will I ever be able to get off of my thyroid medications? And this is a, it's a complicated question, but I think we can break it apart and I can explain why most people, once they have a need for thyroid medications, are not able to get off of it at, in the future. And I mean, I've, I think I've seen over the period of uh, the last 13 years while I've been working with people, three times, if I recall correctly, three times when my clients were able to get off of their thyroid medications. And these were cases where usually it was someone who was very recently diagnosed as hypothyroid um, and, and very recently diagnosed as having Hashimoto's. And they were able to get off of the replacement hormones, but they had to you know, they really had to focus on trying to dampen the cause or address the cause of their their low thyroid. And this was, you know, this was really a, a, a difficult thing to do for them. They had to ask their doctor because you do have to work with your doctor. Once you start any type of medication, you have to work with your prescribing physician so that they can help you to make a determination on whether or not it's something that you can withdraw from or that you can, you know, stop taking at some point. So, you know, working with me and then working with their doctor, they were able to communicate the fact that they don't want to take the medication long term and they want to see if they can improve their health. And in their case, in in in, in these cases, uh, they were all autoimmune. They had Hashimoto's, which if you don't know, Hashimoto's is an autoimmune thyroid condition where your immune system actually attacks your thyroid and it results in destruction of the thyroid gland. And so when once this process has, once Hashimoto's has been going on for a period of time, the thyroid gland becomes destroyed. And the gland becomes destroyed to a point that it can no longer make sufficient thyroid hormone to keep up with your body's need and demand. So this is a problem. This is this is usually at a at an end stage of the process when when your thyroid is destroyed to a point that it can no longer keep up with the needs of the body's production of thyroid hormone this is usually stage 3 autoimmunity so that's stage 3 autoimmunity is the end stage uh, of autoimmune disease where the autoimmune process has been going on typically for at least 10 years even if you're not you're unaware of it and and that's a really important point to make as well is that most autoimmune conditions, most thyroid autoimmune conditions go 10 years before they're diagnosed. And so there's a you know long period of of typically um, some mixed uh, or uh, you know beginning as mild symptomatology where there's where there's fatigue, where there may be brain fog, where there may be you know problems with thermoregulation where you have cold hands, cold feet. There, there can be a lot of symptoms, you know, if the, the, all the classic symptoms of hypothyroidism or low thyroid function. And they progressively get worse and they usually culminate in, you know, much more severe symptoms, uh, hair falling out, uh, you know, significant weight gain, you know, significant constipation is, is, uh, is possible as well. I mean, and these aren't, you know, these are not symptoms that everyone has. I mean, everyone is different. So, that's important to understand, but these are really common. And then, you know, then the person presents to their doctor. Their doctor, you know, takes a history of all their symptoms. They run some testing, and typically, you know, if it's related to the thyroid, the TSH will come back as high. And the TSH is a marker. When it's elevated, it's a marker that your thyroid is probably not producing enough thyroid hormone because your TSH is actually made by your pituitary gland in your brain and it signals the thyroid to produce more thyroid hormone. So when TSH is high, it is a signal from the brain to the thyroid to produce more thyroid hormone. You know, TSH, it's, it's, it's a physiological 
its primary physiological purpose is to stimulate the thyroid to produce thyroid hormone. So when it's elevated, it's kind of like the brain is really trying to step on the gas and signal the thyroid to produce more thyroid hormone because the brain is, is monitoring the thyroid hormone levels in the blood and has determined that there is a greater need for thyroid hormone. And this is, you know, this is, this is, is a scenario in which everything is, is all of the, the feedback systems in the body and the brain are working properly. We're not, we're not assuming that there's any type of pathology like tumors or anything else that could be disturbing or changing that, that feedback loop. So, you know, we, uh, present to the doctor and then the high TSH, and when the TSH is high, they'll, the, the doctor will prescribe thyroid hormone replacement with the sole purpose of normalizing TSH, like getting TSH to come down, which is, which is typically what happens when thyroid hormone is, is uh, prescribed and, and taken, TSH comes down, and then they monitor TSH, and the goal of the hormone replacement therapy is just to get TSH into a normal range. And then it is to observe the symptoms, right? The, the symptoms that you're having and, and see if the symptoms are resolved or improved with that replacement hormone. And so once you've reached, you know, this point of typically this point, if, if, if the hypothyroidism is coming from Hashimoto's, which 90% of the cases it's believed of low thyroid, hypothi- of, of hypothyroidism, which is low thyroid hormone, it comes from Hashimoto's, from this autoimmune thyroid disease, which is the the number one autoimmune disease in the world. It's the most common. It is a major issue. And, you know, quite frankly, the large majority of people that have hypothyroidism are unaware that their low thyroid is actually due to an autoimmune process. And I mean, I think, you know, as a side note, that is a huge problem in and of itself. I mean, I believe that Everyone needs to be checked that's hypothyroid needs to be evaluated to see if they have thyroid antibodies so that we can you can know if you're autoimmune or not because that's not just something that will affect the thyroid. Autoimmunity can expand to other tissues and it does in a, in a large number of the cases. So it is something that can expand and there are things that can be done to help uh, to improve the immune system's function and work towards dampening the autoimmune process. You know, primarily you you focus on uh, identifying triggers of the autoimmune process and trying to remove those or improve uh, nutrient needs that may be involved in the immune system's regulatory function that may not be working appropriately because of deficiencies for example. I mean there there's a there's a lot of complexity complexity to that. But the you know, the main thing is, is that it, it really needs to be understood if you're autoimmune or not, because not only does that affect you and your, you know, potentially the expansion to other tissues and expanded autoimmunity, we see very commonly uh, cerebellar autoimmunity, which is part of the brain, and, uh, and also GI autoimmunity with Hashimoto's. It, it, it is, if it's going to expand, we see common expansion to the brain. And this is, you know, this is a major, major issue. And so I think everyone should be evaluated for antibodies. And if antibodies are detected, and again, you you know, if the statistics are correct, about nine out of 10 people that are low thyroid or hypothyroid have Hashimoto's as the cause. And they have no idea. The vast majority of people have no idea. They just go to their doctor, they have these symptoms, TSH is evaluated. And if it's high, then they're given a thyroid hormone replacement. And that's that. And they just think, well, yeah, yeah, I have a low thyroid, so I take my thyroid hormone replacement. Now, the coming back to the, you know, I think it's important to understand some of these, some of these uh, questions that come up surrounding, you know, can I, will, will I ever be able to get off of my thyroid hormone? Because you need to understand why you're on thyroid hormone in the first place. And for the majority of people, it's going to be because of Hashimoto's. Now, now some people, and and uh, this is, I think, a much, much more, um, it's a much less common. Is you know they have low iodine, uh, or they have uh, they have other other reasons that are causing them to have hypothyroidism. But but the large majority of people have Hashimoto's, and with Hashimoto's. When you, once your thyroid is to a point where it can no longer keep up with the body's need for thyroid hormone, 
you know, that, that typically results with a normal functioning system, normal functioning feedback loop as high TSH, okay, high thyroid hormone stimulating uh, or high, uh, high TSH thyroid stimulating hormone, okay, as being elevated. Once that, once you're to that stage, you have typically had Hashimoto's for an extended period of time and you're just not, you were not aware of it because with, with autoimmune disease, there are three stages of autoimmunity. Stage one is that you have antibodies that are present in the blood, but no symptoms. So you don't notice any difference, but you have antibodies. If you were to check the blood, you would detect antibodies. Now, this is one of the reasons I think anyone that has Hashimoto's, their blood relatives, your children, uh, you know, your, your um, siblings, uh, maybe even your parents, if they have similar symptoms, or if you're just concerned, because there is a genetic connection here too, there is their genetics do play a role. I think that they should be screened for autoimmune diseases. And it's something that should probably be done on a periodic basis because you know that they're genetically susceptible to, de- to developing this autoimmune process. And the earlier that you catch it, the more significant impact you can typically make. Okay, so stage one autoimmunity, there are antibodies, but there are, uh, there are no symptoms, none, no symptoms. Uh, Energy is fine, and we're using the example of hypothyroidism or Hashimoto's. Let's say you have antibodies against your TPO, which is uh, an acronym for thyroid peroxidase. You have antibodies that uh, against TPO, which means that the immune system is tagging it and uh, identifies it as foreign, so it is launching an immune attack against it, destroying the enzyme which is found in the thyroid. And then that, that causes thyroid destruction. Well, stage one, there are antibodies, no symptoms. Stage two, autoimmunity, there are symptoms and antibodies present. Okay, so now you're starting to notice symptoms. And not maybe maybe that means fatigue, maybe that means uh, hair loss, maybe, you know, um, all of these issues, uh, thermoregulation again, cold hands, cold feet, uh, maybe low libido, maybe problems sleeping, uh, all these, all of the common hypothyroid symptoms, okay, are possible. I mean, most people don't have all of them. Most people have a, you know, a few, a few of them. And then as it progresses further, there is now uh, more damage to the thyroid over time. So now the thyroid gets smaller and smaller and has, because of the the immune system attacking and destroying the tissue, now you have less thyroid tissue and less capacity to produce thyroid hormone. So now the thyroid is getting smaller and destroyed, so it cannot keep up with production that is required by the body. TSH now is going to go higher. And now you're at a stage where the thyroid is just not not capable of keeping up with the, uh, the the necessary production and thyroid hormone replacement is necessary so that you can function normally and have normal thyroid hormone stimulation to all the cells of your body because literally every cell in the body requires thyroid hormone. So this is where you know when I'm when I'm asked you know is you know is it possible to get off of thyroid hormone medications? For most people it's you know it's been my experience that it's not. And I think if you if you were to survey people that have you know uh, tried to get off of their thyroid uh, hormones using various means i mean i think that there are really good based on the science that we currently understand the the immunology that we currently understand about autoimmunity i think there are much better um, approaches than I, I would guess things that are, I would say things that are more founded in a scientific, with with the, with the scientific basis to try and, and help dampen the autoimmune process and, and help the, the, the autoimmunity from more of a, a, sci- a science-based method rather than just like random kind of supplementation and trial and error and and whatnot. But I think if you, if you surveyed people that had, that started thyroid hormone, you're going to, you're going to find that the vast majority, and I'm going to say 90% or, or probably higher have not been able to, you know, they, they, they continue to take their thyroid hormone and they have not been able to, uh, to discontinue it. And if anything, the majority of people have had to over time increase their thyroid hormone dose. And this goes back to the fact that most people have hypothyroidism due to Hashimoto's, which is a progressive autoimmune disease that destroys the gland more and more over time, 
reducing your thyroid hormones, your, your thyroid gland's ability to produce thyroid hormone. So it continues to destroy the gland, which continues to decrease your thyroid horm, your, your thyroid's ability to produce thyroid hormone, requiring more and more supplemental hormone replacement uh, via a medication. So most people, their, their experience is that they have to increase thyroid hormone over time. And, and this is, so this comes back to, you know, will I ever be able to get off of my thyroid medication? And I mean, if you look at what we've discussed, what, what, what we've just talked about, you can see why it becomes very difficult, if not impossible for people to discontinue their thyroid hormone. And you absolutely never want to be hypothyroid because every single cell in your body, from your brain cells, to your hair cells, to your skin, to every single cell, your blood cells, your immune cells. They all require thyroid hormone for normal, to carry out normal physiology, to function normally. And you, so you do not want to be hypothyroid. You, you, they're just, you know, the, the, um, the pathophysiology, so the way that Hashimoto's destroys the gland and what actually happens, it just creates an environment where, and, and a scenario where thyroid hormone replacement is typically required and and over the the long term it is something that is is uh, needs to be continued and in a lot of cases it needs to be needs to be increased now no one wants that no no one wants that to occur but i mean these are the reality this is the reality of things as they are today now in the future might there be ways to help the gland regenerate? Well, possibly. I mean, who knows? Uh, there, there have been research. I've talked about this a little bit in the past. There was some research on using like different types of light therapies on the thyroid to try and help with um, lowering antibodies and helping the tissues to, to possibly uh, regenerate. But this is something that I'm really um, uncertain about and leery, uh, and, I, and I don't recommend it because what if there are like cancer cells there? And we know that with autoimmune disease, there's a greater likelihood of developing cancer. So what if cancer, what if you have, you know, the autoimmune attack has caused damage to the DNA of the cells of the thyroid. You have some mutations in the cells. You have, you have some, uh, some cancer maybe that started that's not even that, uh, it's not evident. And then you're using like a red light therapy or something that is stimulatory. Could that actually energize, um, help the, uh, the cancer cells to actually grow and proliferate? I mean, that's a, that's a real, that's a real question that I think we have to ask. And so that's one of the reasons I'm not, I'm not, uh, I'm not a fan of that. I don't, I don't know that that is a good idea. So that's one thing. Uh, the other thing is, well, you know, what about stem cell therapy? What about uh, peptides? What, what, are, what other things might we be able to do? Well, I think there's all hope for those things in the future, but I think, I think that that's all still very, very new uh, science that needs to be investigated uh, much more thoroughly before you start hanging your hat or trying uh, on those things or, or trying those things. I think that the the uh, most logical and best way to approach this to begin with is to take a an approach where you try to dampen the autoimmune process, put it into remission, or at least dampen the autoimmunity so that you have much less destruction of the thyroid gland and you have a better chance to to uh, halt or slow the progression or spreading of the autoimmune process to other tissues. So the approach that that I recommend and that that I use when I'm working with my clients is a detect remove repair approach. So we typically will you know survey the person's physiology and we're I'm just going to focus primarily on the autoimmune component here. And the model that I use is environmentally induced autoimmunity. Okay, this is the this is the framework of th- you know through which I look at autoimmune disease that the that the autoimmune disease is environmentally induced meaning that there are environmental triggers which can be food, peptides, pathogens or chemicals that induce the autoimmune process. There these pe- the people that develop autoimmunity are genetically susceptible. To, to developing the autoimmune process. And the factors that, uh, that are involved here are, are the triggers, which I just mentioned, foods, pathogens, chemicals. Also, broken barrier systems. So your, your barrier systems, like your intestinal lining, your blood-brain barrier, 
your um, your your pulmonary barrier, uh, your skin, your all of these barrier. These are barrier systems where the outside world basically meets the inside world. And when these barrier systems break down, things from the environment, things externally like food proteins, pathogens. Like let's talk about the gut because that's a pretty common one that's discussed these days. Things can make their way from the gut into the bloodstream, triggering an inflammatory response, triggering an immune response that may lead to the to uh, to the uh, to the triggering of autoimmunity or the driving or uh, perpetuation of the autoimmune process through uh, through uh, different immunological mechanisms. Okay, so if you if you look at immunology, and I I, I encourage you to um, if you're really interested in getting at a at a you know a very um, you know academic level with this, I would I would look at the work of Aristo Vojadani, PhD immunologist dedicated probably 45 years of his life to understanding autoimmunity uh, because of his mother's autoimmunity, his mother's uh, rheumatoid arthritis. And uh, really looking at um, looking at these factors, the broken barrier systems, uh, pathogens, chemicals, and food, food peptides, and then also immune regulatory uh, issues and immune regulatory issues. So, so three things: uh, immune regulatory issues, though, are are have more to do with uh, vitamin D deficiencies, essential fatty acid uh, imbalances, glutathione uh, issues, uh, your um, vitamin and mineral problems. I mean, uh, uh, zinc, selenium, magnesium. I mean, you, it it all works together. But you have to understand those factors, try to understand those factors as clearly as you can so that that's the first step of uh, detection of the, the framework. Detect, remove, repair. So step one, detect what are, you know, what, what is actually stimulating the immune system. So we will do very thorough immunological testing to look for antibodies in the blood to these uh, to these foods, to these pathogens, to these chemicals. We will uh, survey and look for uh, deficiencies and issues with immune regulatory function, and we can actually do some testing to assess uh, some of these barrier systems to give us a baseline as well of the integrity or not of the of the uh, immunological barriers. Now, this gives us to date and to my knowledge the very best quantitative assessment, meaning numbers, reproducible laboratory testing to give us numbers, data, not just guessing, not just trial and error, but numbers on what is actually triggering your uh, your immune response, unique to you, will be different for everyone, so that you can then put together the very best plan possible that is, you know, bio-individualized, very custom and tailored to your immune response to help you remove the next step, these triggers. And so what you do is you detect, you, you do the testing and detect what's going on. Then you work to remove the triggers as best you can. And that can be a uh, multi-step process because you sometimes you can't do it all at once. And then you work on repairing the damage as much as possible. So uh, it is a it is a framework that I think gives us the best chance to dampen the autoimmune process and hopefully, you know, if we're lucky, put it into remission. And in that scenario, I think that's where you have the best chance to take, you know, to, to dampen or if you're lucky, again, put into remission the autoimmune assault against the thyroid and, and really see what the thyroid's capacity to recover is. Now, so the, the cells of the thyroid go through mitosis or cellular division. So there's hope that that it might be able to um, to repair. And listen, I've I've had I've had um, clients that I've worked with to actually have parts of the thyroid tissue to regrow. Like literally, they've had it um, ablation or a therapy done that destroys the gland, and then they go and the doctors are like, I can't believe it, but you have some of your thyroid is there, and there and it, and there's some functional tissue. So who knows for sure on on exactly what can be accomplished? But for the majority of people. You know they're not going to be able to stop the thyroid hormone replacement. And I've worked with thousands of people and talked to tens of thousands of people through social media, and uh, and and this is something that is very uncommon. And so, listen, thyroid hormone replacement is a and in medicine, th these things are a true gift to us because it allows us to maintain function while you know we're you know when once we've 
our something has been destroyed, like our thyroid. It allows us to maintain those thyroid hormone levels, words, which are essential to brain function, brain development, our our, enti- our entire physiology. If you don't have thyroid hormone, you are going to be in major trouble. So you need to take thyroid hormone replacement if needed. Just follow your doctor's recommendations and take it if it's needed. And you know what I try to do is I try to complement and help with addressing the factors that are driving the immune response to dampen it so that, you know, you can live the best life possible. And this is, this is really something that I think is important to understand that thyroid hormone replacement is really actually very helpful. Now, listen, some people are going to say, you know what, I've taken thyroid hormone and I felt terrible, or I've taken thyroid hormone and it didn't do anything for me. That's because there are other mechanisms at play as well. It's, it's never the case, I'm going to tell you, it's never the case that when I work with someone and we survey their physiology and we get testing and we, we look at, at, at what all could be driving these symptoms, it's never the case that the only problem is low thyroid. It's never the case. There are always other issues. Like there are, uh, there are other issues with anemia or there are other issues with blood sugar dysregulation or there are other issues with high inflammatory levels. And these, all of these things contribute to the same symptoms of hypothyroidism. So some people will think that it's all related to their thyroid. And in reality, once you start, we dig into it and we look at it, it may not be their thyroid at all. The thyroid might be perfect. It might be an inflammatory issue. It might be, uh, it might be, um, you know, again, issues with uh, the red blood cells and anemia, or maybe it's a, a major blood sugar issue. And so what we try to do and what I, what I try to help people with is look at what's happening and put together a plan that helps you with all of these other nuances and problems that that could be going on and happening at one time to try to give us the best opportunity to have a good outcome and uh, thrive not just you know survive but actually to thrive and and function so that's the main thing that I wanted to share today is that thyroid medications getting off of them i mean i think it's you know what if it's possible great. That's awesome. No one wants to have to take something every day of their life. I get it. But keep this in mind. It is a true gift that we have the science to be able and provide thyroid hormone to people. And it, it is a true, uh, is a true uh, lifesaver and will it, it can help you to maintain function in very dramatic ways. So, you know, I though I think it's I know people have that question. I want to really share the reality of what I've observed. You know, what I hope in the future that we have technologies and things that will allow people to regenerate their thyroid if it's been if it's been damaged, and you know, then therefore kind of get back to uh, their uh, endogenous or their their thyroid producing the hormone that's needed and not having to take something. But for now, we don't we don't have that capability. But I hope I hope in the future it's a it's a real possibility for us. But I hope this makes sense, and I hope this helps you to better understand the need for thyroid replacement therapy, thyroid hormone replacement therapy, and uh, why you know having a goal of getting off of it may not be the best way to um, really spend your energy and time, but really focus on why you have a need for it in the first place, which is probably Hashimoto's and how working to dampen the autoimmune process could be the key. So if you need help with your, your thyroid issues, or if you, if you have hypothyroidism, or if you've been diagnosed with Hashimoto's and you would like our help, you can reach out to us. You can uh, visit our website at uh, drbradshook.com. That's just D-R- and then my name, Brad, B-R-A-D, and then Shook, S-H-O-O-K.com. And you can learn more about working with me one-on-one as a distance consulting client. I work with people across the U.S. and around the world. Or you might want to check out our transformation program. That is a uh, dietary lifestyle uh, program that we've put together. And I actually use it a lot with my clients that I work one-on-one as a, as a foundational backbone of the dietary approach lifestyle approach, and even some temporary nutritional supplementation that we find is often helpful for people that have uh, Hashimoto's, that have uh, autoimmune uh, issues at, uh, at helping them to understand the dietary and lifestyle strategies that are very commonly help with autoimmune processes. And so that, that might be an option as well, and you can learn more about that at thyroidprogram.com. But 
As always, I appreciate you hanging out with me today. If you have any questions, please reach out to us. You can find us on YouTube. Uh, you can find us on Facebook. We have a Facebook group called the Greater Hickory Thyroid Support Group. There are about 12,000 members. It's free to join. You can get in there. You can ask questions, and everybody's trying to, uh, to help out. So uh, feel free to join us there, too. But I do appreciate you all. I hope you have a wonderful day, and I look forward to talking to you again soon.